everybody. I do trust and pray that you all are doing well. I know that God has caused his face to shine upon us, and for that we thank him for his grace and for his mercy. Today I want to play for you a uh, teaching that I did back in June uh, entitled A Man on the Run. And we take that premise from the book of Jonah. But I want you to take a, a fresh look um, at this video um, and pay close attention uh, specifically to the sovereignty of God and all the aspects of the sovereignty of God that we've been talking about over the past few weeks. Pay close attention to um, the transcendence of God, the fact that he is creator of all things, um, that he has complete autonomy uh, and power over every circumstance and over every situation. Um, so let's listen in. Uh, let's be blessed by the teaching again. Today, I want to look at the book of Jonah. I want to look at the narrative surrounding the life and the ministry of Jonah and how that relates to us as Christian believers today. Jonah chapter one, verse number one says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. I want to look at this thought, a man on the run, a man on the run. Anthony Carter says that the book of Jonah is a concise version of the story of redemption. He says that the book of Jonah is a miniature version of the narrative surrounding the, the story of redemption. For in redemption, the story of redemption, we, we see the sovereignty of God, the sinfulness of man, and the sufficiency of Christ. And as we look at the book of Jonah, uh, throughout Jonah, uh, those nuances of the redemptive story or the story of redemption is found uh, in the book of Jonah and the sovereignty of God, the sinfulness of man. And we see a topology of the sufficiency of Christ, right? So we see the sovereignty of God, the sinfulness of man, and the topology of the sufficiency of Christ. For that reason, uh, and not that reason alone, but for that reason, uh, it makes the book of Jonah relevant to the life of the Christian today. Uh, it is first relevant, relevant because uh, it is scripture. And Paul said uh, to his son of the ministry, Timothy, that all scripture is God breathed, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so the relevancy of Jonah first lies in the fact that it is scripture, that it is God breathed, that it is given by the inspiration of God. Uh, but more so in, or not necessarily more so, uh, but secondarily, or secondly, rather, <laughs> um, it is relevant to us in the sense that it speaks to uh, the current situation and it speaks to those who are in front of the text okay it speaks not only to those uh, behind the text and in the text but it speaks to us who occupy the space uh, that is in front of the text and so uh, it, it allows christian believers who are three four thousand years removed from a particular passage of scripture uh, to relate and see how uh, these pieces of scripture are applicable uh, to our lives today. Uh, Jonah is a, a fascinating character. He's a fascinating human, a fascinating figure uh, in the history of mankind and in the history of the biblical narrative. Uh, I believe that uh, many of us uh, can see ourselves in Jonah. Many of us uh, can have a connection uh, with the prophet Jonah. Uh, Jonah uh, seems to be a, a relatable prophet or relatable historical figure 
a relatable biblical figure uh, that we can touch and that we can uh, uh, relate to and agree with uh, concerning some of the things uh, that he went through uh, and some of the uh, situations he found himself in. And so uh, what's interesting here is that um, Jonah receives the word of the Lord, right? He receives the word of the Lord uh, to go down to Nineveh, to go preach to the Ninevites. And the Bible says that uh, their sin, in essence, have come up before him, come up before God. Uh, and God uh, is ready to judge. God uh, is ready to condemn. Uh, but he wants to give the Ninevites another opportunity. Uh, he wants to invite them uh, into his grace. Right. And it's amazing how we see the grace of God, even uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, he, he wants to invite them into uh, that level of grace, that level of mercy. Uh, he wants to extend his hand of grace, his hand of mercy towards the Ninevites who do not deserve the grace and the mercy that God is willing to extend uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they're not Israelites. All right. Uh, and so uh, they're not born uh, into uh, that family uh, that you would think that deserves the grace and the mercy of God. Right. They're not Israelites. So that, that's one knock against them. Uh, and, and that's the major knock against them is that or well, not the major, but that is one knock against them is that they are not a part of that Israelite bloodline. But the major knock against them is that they are sinful. <laughs> OK. They are sinful and because of their sin, they don't deserve the grace of God because of their actions, because of their disobedience uh, and because of uh, what they've done uh, to shame the name of God. Even though they are not the people of God and are, and are marked by God, uh, nevertheless, their actions shame uh, the name of God. And so looking at that, they don't deserve the hand of grace. They don't deserve God's hand of mercy. And just like the Ninevites, <laughs> we don't deserve God's hand of grace. We don't deserve God's hand of mercy. One, because we're not born into the Israelite family. Two, we are sinful. All right. And so uh, and so the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. Right. He says, go to Nineveh, preach to the Ninevites. Jonah receives this word and Jonah flees. The Bible says he runs. He flees and goes to a ship that is heading down to Tarshish. He goes to Joppa. Uh, he finds a ship that is heading down to Tarshish. He gets on that ship, on that boat, heading to Tarshish, fleeing, as the Bible says, the presence of the Lord. The first thing that Jonah runs from, or the first thing that Jonah does is he runs from the presence of God, right? He's a man on the run. He runs from the presence of God. And in his running from the presence of the God, presence of the God, from the presence of God, he finds himself now in the ship, on the boat, and there's a storm, right? He's on, he's on a boat and a storm hits as he's running from the presence of God, right? When he runs and tries to flee from the presence of God, he finds himself now in a storm. Storm hits, right? And now he and his company are afraid. What's interesting here and what's important to note is that whenever we flee from the presence of God or call ourselves fleeing from the presence of God, we can uh, assure ourselves that we're going to run ourselves into a storm. All right. Whenever we flee from the presence of God, we can assure ourselves that we're going to run into a storm. That is why it is important that we maintain connection with God, that we resolve in our mind to make sure that we stay connected to God. Despite what's going on, despite what our current situation may be, we have to make up in our mind to never lose connection and relationship with God. It is in Jonah's running from the presence of God 
that he finds himself in a storm. Now, that is not to say that if we stay connected with God, that if we stay in relationship with God, that storms are not going to come. That's not what I'm saying. We know that to be true, that storms will come uh, regardless of our position uh, in God. But the difference is if a storm comes and I'm in the presence of God, <laughs> I'm in the presence of God. And that means he has the power uh, to deliver me out of the storm. All right. If a storm comes and I'm in the presence of God, then that gives me a heightened assurance uh, to know that what I'm facing, I'm in it with God. But it is a dangerous place to be in a storm and away from the presence of God. There is no uh, there is no safety net. There is no security. There is no peace. There is no calmness. There is no assurity. Or, or sureness when you are in a storm and you have separated yourself from the presence of God. We can handle storms while we're in the presence of God, but we cannot handle a storm outside of the presence of God. And so Jonah finds himself when he runs and flees from the presence of God, when he separates from the presence of God, he finds himself in a storm. And this particular storm comes because God is redirecting the life of Jonah. All right. So Jonah is fleeing the presence of God, but he doesn't even realize that as he's fleeing the presence of God, uh, he really cannot separate from the presence of God. He thinks that he's fleeing the presence of God. But God says uh, that even though you think you're fleeing from my presence, <laughs> I'm still there. All right. The psalmist says, whither shall I flee? Where can I flee uh, from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? If, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I, if I ascend into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning, dwell into the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, uh, shall uh, you lead me and your right hand shall hold me up. And so uh, even though we think that we're fleeing the presence of God, the truth of the matter is j the, the, the life, the narrative of Jonah shows us that while we think we're fleeing from the presence of God, God is still there to redirect us. All right. How does he redirect Jonah? Uh, he redirects him by sending the storm. All right. The storm comes. Uh, and the, the people on the ship are like, okay, what's going on? All right. This storm is coming. Uh, and, and at that time you gotta, you gotta know, uh, that individuals believe that uh, when things happen, uh, it, it's for a reason. All right. When, when negative things come, uh, they understood that it was for a purpose and for a reason, or they, or they believe that it was for a purpose and for a reason. And so they began to you know, pray to their gods and they began to cast lots to see what was going on and why they were in the storm. Uh, and it came down to Jonah. Jonah said, okay, I'm the reason that we are in this storm. Jonah recognized that the storm was God's way of redirecting him back to doing what he was called to do. All right. God told Jonah to go down to Nineveh to preach to the Ninevites, that great city, the Bible calls it, that wicked city, uh, the capital of Assyria, go down to Nineveh, preach to them, right? Jonah refused and he ran. The storm came to redirect Jonah back to where God wanted him to be, right? So Jonah says, okay, uh, we're, we're not going to get out of this storm. The only way we're going to get out of this storm is if you throw me overboard, right? So you know the story, you know the text, they, they take Jonah, throw him overboard, right? When they throw him overboard, the Bible says that a great fish that has been prepared by God swallows Jonah. So he runs from the presence of God and in his running from the presence of God, he indirectly runs directly into the power of God. As he's running from the presence of God, he finds himself running into the power of God. There's two instances where we see the power of God. One is the storm. 
Secondly, and where I want to hang my hat on, is the great fish that God prepares to swallow up Jonah. Right? He flees from the presence of God. And as he's fleeing from the presence of God, he runs directly into the power of God. Bible says God prepares a great fish to swallow Jonah whole. Now, this particular part of the scripture, this particular part of the book of Jonah uh, has been met with great scrutiny. Uh, there's been many people to try to discredit uh, the validity of of the book of Jonah and therefore the Bible uh, by saying uh, that it is anatomically impossible for a whale to swallow a human, right? This is the argument that people use to try to discredit the Bible, to discredit the book of Jonah, and then subsequently to discredit the book of, or discredit, discredit the Bible uh, by saying that uh, it is anatomically impossible for a whale to swallow Jonah or any kind of fish to swallow a human. I agree. It is anatomically impossible for any fish, any whale, uh, any mammal to swallow, any sea mammal to swallow a human being. But the first thing we have to notice is the Bible does not say that a whale swallowed Jonah. That is not what the Bible says. <laughs> the Bible does not say that a whale swallowed Jonah. The Bible says that Jonah was swallowed up by a great fish. And here's where the power of God comes in. Notice the language of the text. Notice the language of the scripture. The Bible says that the fish was prepared by God. Right? The Bible says that God prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. The Bible never says it was a whale. The Bible says that a great fish, do we know what kind of fish it was? No, <laughs> but a great fish that was prepared by God swallows up Jonah, which gives us reason to believe and reason to, to have assurance in the word of God uh, that the power of God meets what is anatomically impossible and makes it possible. When the power of God comes into the equation, what man says is impossible, God makes possible. Hallelujah. What is impossible with man is beyond possible with God. Remember what the writer says, that he is able to do exceeding abundantly, all that we may ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. If we can think it, God can exceed it. Not only can he do it, but he can exceed what we think. And so, yes, it is anatomically impossible. The, the, the body structure of any fish is not able to swallow a human. But when God prepares a situation... He can take the impossible and make it beyond possible. Hallelujah. And so Jonah uh, ends up running into the power of God. And that power of God takes impossibilities and make those impossibilities possible. Hallelujah. God has so much power, uh, or rather God is so much power, that he can take what is impossible and make it possible. Hallelujah. And not only can he make it possible, but he can make it beyond possible. We cannot continue to limit the power of God. We cannot limit the power of God. We can't, let me say it again. We can not limit the power of God. We may not understand Everything that God does, everything that God is able to do, everything that God is willing to do. But at the end of the day, we are called to trust in the sovereignty and the power of God. Because only God can take what seems to be impossible and allow it to come to fruition. 
allow it to come to pass. Allow it to manifest within our life. So whatever you thought was impossible. Yes, it may be impossible to you. Yes, it may be impossible to me, but it is possible and beyond that in the eyesight and in the hand and the will and the sovereignty of God. So Jonah runs, flees from the presence of God. And as he's fleeing from the presence of God, he ends up running directly into the power of God as God has prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And it is there in the great fish, in the belly of the fish that God prepared, we find Jonah praying. Hallelujah. Jonah uh, runs from the presence of God. He runs from the presence of God directly into the power of God. And while he's in the belly of the great fish that God has prepared, he is now praying and repenting unto God. Right. It is there now where Jonah finds himself getting ready to encounter the provision of God. Right. He flees from the presence, run directly into the power. And now he, he he's about to find himself in, uh, in indulging in the provision of God. He prays. And the Bible says that God called that same great fish to swallow him up to get to now throw him up, to throw him up, right? To vomit, to spit him up on dry land, right? Jonah, even though he fleed the presence of God, found himself running directly into the power of God, and now he's getting ready to be a beneficiary of the provision of God. God speaks to the fish. The fish obeys and throws up Jonah. Hallelujah. God speaks to the fish. The fish obeys and throws up Jonah. What you have to realize is that uh, th the Bible describes those three days and, and three nights that Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Uh, the, the Bible describes that as Jonah being in the belly of hell. <laughs> Jonah was in the belly of hell as he's in the fish. Even Jesus describes it as that when he says uh, that he shall be uh, uh, in, in the depths of the earth <clears throat> as Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Describes it as uh, the belly of hell. And so Jonah had to suffer hell for three days and three nights. <laughs> but throughout all of that, the provision of God gets ready to overtake him. Because God speaks to the to, to the belly of the fish. And when he speaks to the belly of the fish, the belly of the fish has to throw Jonah up on dry land. And all I'm trying to tell you is that what's been holding you down for however, for however long it's been, what's been holding you down is getting ready to throw you up. My God. What's been holding you down is getting ready to throw you up. What has been suppressing you? God says what suppressed you is getting ready to elevate you. What's been holding you down is getting ready to throw you up. What you've been dealing with, what you've had to, to overcome, what you've had to endure, the word of the Lord in this season is that it held you down for a moment. It held you down for a season. It held you down for a time. But God says, I'm getting ready to speak to the belly of the fish. Hallelujah. I'm going to speak to the belly of the fish. The belly of hell is getting ready to throw you up. What held you down is getting ready to catapult you into that next dimension, that next realm that you're getting ready to walk with God in. Just like Jonah, hallelujah, what's been holding you down was only there as an incubator, hallelujah. It was only there to prepare you and to process you for where God is calling you to be. 
Hallelujah. We've been held down for a moment now. We've been held down for a while now. But I hear the spirit of the Lord say, this is not a time of destruction, but this is a time of preparation. Hallelujah. This is the time for us to see the provision of God. Don't waste the time that we have in the belly of the fish. You'll catch that when you get home. You're already home, so you should already caught it. Don't waste time that God has us in the belly of the fish. Hallelujah. Don't waste the preparation time. Don't waste the preparation moment that God has given us to prepare us and to propel us to who he's called us to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've been in hell long enough. God's getting ready to throw us up. He's getting ready to call the, the belly of that fish, the belly of hell, to throw us up. Hallelujah. He runs into the provision of God. And that power of God is seen in the provision of God. All right? So the, the belly of the fish, the fish throws up Jonah, right? Uh, but it doesn't just throw him up for Jonah's sake, right? Jonah now has a job to do. <laughs> he, he, he does not get thrown up. Just so he can do whatever he wanted to do. There's a purpose. And there's a call that Jonah has to fulfill. So the Bible says and now Jonah goes down and fulfills the call that God has on his life. He goes to Nineveh. Preaches to Nineveh. Remember, Nineveh is in great sin. In great wickedness. Jonah preaches the word of the Lord to the Ninevites. Hallelujah. Preaches the word of the Lord to the Ninevites. And the Bible says that upon hearing the word of the Lord, they change. It's a process. 40 days. It's a process. But Jonah preaches. And through the revival, the Ninevites are convicted of their sin against the Holy One of Israel. They're convicted of their sin against God. And the Bible says they repent in sackcloth and ashes. So he runs from the presence of God indirectly, but directly into the power of God. And in doing so, he finds himself getting ready to encounter running into the provision of God. And now after being a recipient of the provision of God, he ends up running into the providence of God, into the providence of God. What is the providence of God? The providence of God is the maintenance and the guidance that, that God has over his creation. It is the maintenance, the guidance, the involvement uh, that God has to preserve and, and support his creation. God did not set things in motion and then step back from his creation. He is actively involved in his creation, right? He is actively involved in the life of mankind, right? He, he is actively involved. And so that providence we see in the lives of the Ninevites is that they deserve death. But the providence of God allowed him to be patient with the Ninevites. Jonah preaches, they repent, and God extends his hand of grace and his hand of mercy. Jonah preaches, they repent, God extends his hand of grace, his hand of mercy. Let me say it again. Jonah preaches, the Ninevites repent. God extends his hand of grace and his hand of mercy upon receiving the word of God. They repent in sackcloth and ashes and they receive the grace and the mercy of God. The providence of God is at work in the lives of the Ninevites where uh, they, they should have been cast away. They should have been cast down. But the patience, 
the maintenance, the guidance, the involvement of God in his creation afforded them time to receive his grace and to receive his mercy. Hallelujah. I don't know if you can, if you cannot see yourself in this particular text, but I can see myself in this text where I deserved to be cast away. I deserved to be cast down. But thank God for the providence of God, the, the ability, the, the maintenance, the guidance, the involvement, and the patience that he has with us, that he has with me. Hallelujah. I thank God, and we all should thank God for the patience that he has with us. Notice what I'm saying. We should thank him for the patience that he has not had because it, it's not a past tense with me. It's a present tense with me. I thank God for the patience that he has continuously with me. Hallelujah. For we fall short of the glory of God every day of our life. And the providence of God enables him and allows him and reveals him to be a patient God in the life of the Christian, in the life of the believer. Hallelujah. Jonah ends up running and seeing firsthand the providence of God for the Ninevites. They receive the word of the Lord. They repent in sackcloth and ashes from the king down. They repent in sackcloth and ashes. Turn unto God. Isn't it amazing how God shows to the Ninevites that uh, even in the Old Testament, that there, there is a place for the Gentiles in the redemptive story of God. Remember, the Ninevites are not Israelites. They're not the chosen people of God. But even before Jesus comes in the flesh in the New Testament, God has shown his redemptive plan for all of mankind. Because of the sheep he have that are not of this fold. And at the end of the day, when he calls forth, every sheep that belongs to him is going to run through the sheep gate. Hallelujah. I thank God that the plan for redemption of the Gentiles has always been in play. The provision of God, uh, the providence of God we see here. We see the providence of God for the Ninevites. And not only that, but the providence of God that we see for Jonah. Because Jonah is about to get crazy. Jonah preaches the Ninevites receive his word. The Ninevites change and repent. They're saved in a, in, a, in a sense. They receive the hand of grace, the extended hand of mercy from God. But Jonah gets upset. <laughs> Jonah preaches to the Ninevites. They change. The hand of God, the, the, the grace of God is, is extended. The hand of God's mercy is extended. Jonah gets upset that God extended grace to the Ninevites. Jonah gets angry that God extends mercy to the Ninevites. Although Jonah preached the word of God, he didn't want the word of God to take effect in the life of the Ninevites. He could not separate his prejudice of the Ninevites from the position and the call that God had over his life. He could not separate his prejudice of the Ninevites from the purpose that God had over his life. Isn't it amazing how this individual who's supposed to care about the souls of individuals 
doesn't even care that the word of God has has worked in the life of his seemingly enemies. Jonah w- rather to have the word of God take no effect than to have the word of God take effect in the life of the Ninevites. He gets angry. And now what happens is Jonah now gets to this point where now after he's seen the provision of God, now he's in need of that same provision or that same providence, excuse me, of that same providence that God extended to the Ninevites. Jonah now finds himself in need of the grace and the mercy of God. He talks to God and he expresses his anger towards God as to why God did what he did in saving the Ninevites. He expresses his anger towards God. And God replies back with a rebuttal that could not be met with any more of Jonah's complaints because God essentially says, I'm sovereign. (laughs) God essentially tells him, I'm sovereign. He gives him an illustration and without going into the illustration, he gives him illustration. And in that illustration, God shows and manifests the or reveals his sovereignty concerning every situation. God tells Jonah, don't tell me how to do my job. In essence, God tells Jonah, you are, you are in no position to tell me, God says, how to be God. You are in no position to tell me how to extend my grace and my mercy. You are in no position to tell me how to express my sovereignty. What you are in position is to trust my sovereignty. And that's the word of the Lord for us today. That we are in no position to tell God how to operate in his sovereignty. We are in no position to tell God how to extend his hand of grace, how to extend his hand of mercy. But we are in position to trust his sovereignty. It's amazing that even though Jonah did not want to do it, he fleed from the presence of God. His purpose still was fulfilled. It's amazing how he he fleed from the presence of God. And even after completing his purpose, he was upset (laughs) that uh, he had success. But yet he still fulfilled his purpose. What does that say to us? It says to us that despite the road we take, despite what we do to uh, circumvent and try to go around the purpose, God has a way of redirecting and navigating our steps, navigating our paths to bring us to our purpose. God says either we can go to purpose from receiving his word straight to the purpose, or we can take All these detours, eventually, doesn't matter which way we take, we're going to end up at purpose. The question is, (laughs) would you rather hear the word of the Lord and go straight to the purpose? Or would you hear the word of the Lord, deny the word of the Lord, and have to go through all of these obstacles, all of these detours, to get us to our purpose. God has a way of taking us, regardless of the direction we go, directly into our purpose. Even if that means taking us kicking and screaming. Purpose, your purpose, will be fulfilled. 
The question is, will we go directly to purpose or will we take various obstacles and detours to get to purpose? Even now, I have to give you this disclaimer. It doesn't matter if we go straight from his voice to purpose. That doesn't mean that that straight and narrow is not filled with heels and, and ridges, bumps and bruises along the way. That, that's, that, that's not what I'm saying. That, that's not what the purpose of God is. Because those, those bruises, those, those ridges, those hills and mountains and valleys, peaks and lows are a part of the process that strengthens us. Is a part of that process that allows us to understand the purpose. But there's a difference between going through the ridges, the highs and the lows that are a part of the purpose versus creating detours and going the long way to our purpose. But at the end of the day, if there's purpose over your life, and I believe it is, God will navigate your steps. He will navigate your direction to get you to fulfill that purpose. Jonah was a man on the run. Some of you today are men and women on the run. But God says, regardless of which direction you run, <laughs> I'm going to navigate it so that you meet purpose. Hey man, we thank God um, for the word. We thank God for uh, what he has revealed to us through his scripture. Uh, and sometimes God does have to carry us to our destiny, kicking and screaming. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, his sovereignty uh, remains supreme uh, and rules and super rules uh, over every area of our life. Uh, we just gotta learn how to trust uh, in his sovereignty Trust that God knows what he's doing. Uh, trust that uh, he has uh, a perfect plan and a perfect will. We may not understand it. Um, and at times, um, our humanists may not agree. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, God is sovereign. Uh, we're human and we trust his, his wisdom. Uh, for his wisdom is infinite. Ours is finite. His vision is infinite. His vision is perfect, rather. Ours is imper imper imperfect. <laughs> Um, but we trust God, we have faith in Him, and our, and our confidence remains in Him. Let's close in a moment of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you once again to thank you for your sovereignty. We ask you, Father, that you'll give us the strength to continue to trust you, to continue to believe you, despite our circumstance, despite our situation. Help us, Father, to have trust in you, to have confidence in you, knowing that you're too wise to make any mistakes, and you're too good to do any harm unto us. Help us, God, to continue to walk circumspectly with you, to walk upright, to walk justly. We give your name to praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. I hope you were blessed um, by the replaying of the clip or replaying of the entire sermon or teaching um, and that uh, you was able to pull something out of it. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Remember to continue to believe God.